are really honored to be here today with you to share about the Mastery Based Learning Workgroup's process to create a state profile of the graduate. And we are also going to provide an overview of the Mastery Based Learning work happening in our state. Just as a reminder, you did receive the Mastery Based Learning Workgroup's 2021 report last month. Next slide. And one more, please. In 2019, House Bill 1599 created the state's Mastery Based Learning Workgroup. We had four legislative members. We were very lucky to have Senator Wellman on the workgroup and as a champion for Mastery Based Learning in our state. Additionally, there were members representing the various levels of our education system, including state level organization representatives, as well as a local school board member, superintendent, principal, teacher, counselor, and a student. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paul Petrie, the State Board of Education's representative to the work group to share some thoughts about the work. Thank you, Alyssa. Chair Wellman, Senate Early Learning and K-12 Education Committee members, thank you for this opportunity to discuss mastery-based learning and the profile of a graduate. To start, uh, um, start, I'd like to commend Dr. Randy Spaulding and Alyssa Mueller uh, and the State Board of Education team for all the work uh, through listening sessions and various meetings to get input on the profile of a graduate. They have opened up the opportunity for students, families, and communities to give feedback on this vital initiative. Chair Wellman and committee members, we see mastery-based learning as 21st century learning. We see it as being of vital importance to the state of Washington because of its innovation and technology-based economy. Our current education model is more of an industrial era model of teaching and learning in which most aspects of learning are tied to units of time. Mastery-based learning, on the other hand, is not time bound. It is focused on learning and mastery of course materials and associated skills. That is a significant shift from our more passive mode of learning to a more active model. Why is this important? The importance of mastery-based learning is that it empowers the learner. It embraces each student as a learner and honors the knowledge they bring to the classroom and the school setting. It builds on their interests and encourages them to develop projects and to solve problems. I mentioned our current model of teaching and learning being tied to units of time and not actual mastery of course content. Students engaged in mastery-based learning can pro progress through courses on, upon mastery of course content and associated skills. One of the critical pieces to this approach is that it, it seeks to engage the learner in the educational process. It engages the learner in the educational process. When I first started as a member of the mastery-based learning work group, it was a new concept to me. Uh, since then, what I've learned from my colleagues, primarily in teacher education, is that mastery-based learning is not new. Along with that, these colleagues who are teacher educators consider it to be just good teaching. I've also learned that organizations like the Aurora Institute and many states around our country have worked to perfect mastery-based learning. So it's really come a long way. And so we, and we also have models that we can draw from. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Alyssa. Thanks, Paul. Next slide, please. Mastery-based learning values the learning experiences that take place in environments outside of the traditional classroom and can accommodate multiple ways to demonstrate student learning through cultural experiences like a tribal canoe journey, work-based learning experiences like internships, and project-based learning where students are solving real problems in their community. Next slide. I wanted to take just a minute to tell you about the new Mastery-Based Learning Collaborative Grant Project that was created as a result of the Mastery-Based Learning Workgroup recommendations and Washington's biennial budget, generously including funding for implementation of Mastery-Based Learning and school district demonstration sites. 
The Mastery Based Learning Collaborative will offer professional learning to educators and support schools in implementing Mastery Based Learning through an equity lens. School grant awardees will participate in the collaborative to share effective practices for implementing mastery based learning. And the project's overarching goal is to inform future policy by helping decision makers better understand what quality mastery based learning looks like, how long it takes to implement, and what resources are necessary. Under the leadership of the State Board of Education and with executive sponsorship from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Professional Educator Standards Board, the project will involve a statewide effort, including staff at state agencies, region, regional educational service districts, community-based partners, educator preparation programs, and the participating schools. We've also created the Collaborative Consulting Group, an informal advisory group that will act as a sounding board as we implement mastery-based learning across the state. Members represent the K-12 system, higher education, industry, and community-based organizations. The grant project includes three other key groups, the participating schools, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. Then we have also contracted with the Aurora Institute to be the independent evaluator for the project. They are the premier mastery-based learning organization in the country, so we're really excited to be working with them. We are also in the middle of selecting a professional learning provider through a competitive process right now. Next slide. We have 18 schools who were selected to be part of our founding cohort, um, three of which are doing mastery-based learning already. We envision this spring as a planning period for schools and the next two school years as professional learning years. We know that full implementation of mastery-based learning across the entire school building can take six to eight years or more. So our goal is for full building implementation to begin by the end of the 2023 to 2024 school year. Schools already at full building implementation when they began participating will have enhanced their implementation and importantly shared knowledge and resources with the schools new to mastery based learning. For the schools who are not ready to commit to making the full transition to mastery based learning yet, but were interested in learning more, we've also developed the friends of the mastery based learning collaborative group. This group will have the opportunity to attend professional learning events on a space available basis. Next slide. I wanted to spend some time talking about what the research says regarding mastery-based learning benefits. Um, I do just want to acknowledge that terminology varies across different states. Generally speaking, mastery-based learning, which is what Washington has chosen to use and was in Washington's legislation, is interchangeable with what other states have called competency-based education. There's a definition of mastery-based learning that's widely acknowledged in the field that has five components. Because mastery-based learning has these five components, robust studies of mastery-based learning implemented in its entirety are limited. In several studies, schools would say they were implementing mastery-based learning, but really evaluators would find they had only made small shifts or were only implementing some, but not all of the components of mastery-based learning. Change also takes time, and so administrators have cautioned against conducting research on student outcomes for districts and schools too early in implementation because significant time is required to ensure that mastery-based learning practices are implemented to their full potential, and collecting data on student outcomes too early could produce misleading results. Rather than a student being moved along in the content with knowledge gaps and mastery-based learning, students don't move on until they've mastered the essential knowledge and skills. And so advocates point to this as one way that mastery-based learning can reduce opportunity and achievement gaps. There's also been a lot of research done that supports the benefit of mastery-based learning assessment models. They've been shown to prevent gaps in student learning among diverse student populations, build confidence in students, positively influence student mindsets, improve student and teacher relationships because students and teachers become partners in the learning process. Mastery-based learning assessment models also contribute to long-term retention and support deeper learning and cross-curricular connections and motivate students for future learning. Ongoing feedback also supports the building of students' social and emotional learning skills, such as perseverance and problem solving. One of the more recent studies done around um, performance-based assessments was around schools participating in the New York Performance Standards Consortium that use performance-based assessments to assess student progress and have collaborated to add authentic evidence of student learning to the college admissions process. 
a study of that program supports other findings, suggesting that learning experiences structured around performance-based assessments, which are key to mastery-based learning, can help narrow opportunity and achievement gaps. Mastery-based learning also honors the unique contributions of every student and the knowledge they bring from their diverse cultures and communities. And research shows that students learn best when they can connect their cultural backgrounds to what they are learning in school. Outcomes of a literature review of implementation from research conducted from 2000 to 2019 found mixed results regarding if mastery-based learning supports improved academic achievement, increased student engagement, and other academic outcomes like increased attendance. Several of these studies found evidence of all of these things, but other studies found negative impacts, especially if they were done early in the implementation process. That's part of why our mastery-based learning grant projects that I mentioned on the last slide are so important. We're setting it up to include a robust evaluation from the beginning so that we can learn more about the impacts of mastery-based learning on underserved students, particularly students of color, students with disabilities, and students from low-income households. Next slide. And then one more. And one more, thank you. So switching gears just a little bit, um, as Senator Wellman has shared, Washington is taking steps to increase our capacity to move towards a more personalized learning system by developing the profile of a graduate. You can think of this work as a way of re-examining what we are asking students to know how to do and how we ask them to demonstrate that. The Mastery-Based Learning Workgroup was charged by Substitute Senate Bill 5249 to develop the profile of a graduate by December of 2021, describing the cross-disciplinary skills a student needs to develop by the time they graduate from high school in order to be successful in their next steps in life, whatever those might be. The profile of a graduate is a way of enabling our educators to focus on all of the important skills in the classroom we want our students to learn beyond just the academic content, like critical thinking and problem solving and financial and digital literacy. Next slide. The profile of a graduate will set the vision for what we require of all students, regardless of how we deliver instruction in either a more traditional school or in a school that has implemented mastery-based learning. The profile is also a way to redefine more holistic graduation requirements based on what students need to know and be able to do for future success. The work group hopes that the profile of a graduate will serve as the overarching vision for our education system moving forward and as one that schools, families, and communities will embrace because they helped develop it. Next slide. The work group wanted to make sure and provide a variety of ways for Washington residents to provide feedback to develop uh, the profile of a graduate. Across all methods, the work group engaged with more than 40 organizations and over 500 people provided specific feedback to inform the profile of a graduate. Next slide. So I'm not gonna read these to you, but I did just wanna include for your reference a few of the quotes from the over 300 responses to the profile of a graduate survey we received. Next slide. I wanted to show just a couple of examples of profiles of a graduate from a local district and from another state. So you can compare those to Washington's in just a moment. So next slide. On the left, you see the profile of a graduate from the Snoqualmie Valley School District in Washington. Like most districts, Snoqualmie Valley's purpose for developing the portrait is that in addition to a rigorous academic foundation and strong subject mastery that they aspire to help students gain, the portrait of a graduate focus is turning the district's attention to helping students develop the personal skills and attributes they need to be successful post high school. The district developed it back in 2019 with several methods of hearing from their local community during the process. They then developed a three-year plan to implement the portrait throughout the district and their curriculum. On the right, you see South Carolina's profile of a graduate. In South Carolina, conversations around new definitions of student success began at the local level, and then the state adopted the profile of a graduate in 2013. Five years later, the state developed the competencies of the profile you see on screen to make the profile actionable in all schools and classrooms around the state. Each competency or interdisciplinary skill has rubrics with six levels that track student growth and readiness for post-secondary success. 
the state's Department of Education provides ongoing professional learning opportunities around the profile of a graduate and associated competencies, including a teacher leader fellows network to lead the implementation in their own communities and regions. Next slide. These are some of the attributes I see listed the most in graduate profiles from around the country. You'll see that the four C's are on here of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking, because many local districts will start with these four C's and then build based on what they hear from their communities. I would also note that some profiles like the state of Utah specifically include call outs to both academic skills as well as social and emotional skills. Next slide. The Mastery Based Learning Workgroup members believe that Washington has an imperative to shift the focus of our education system from an industrial model that sorts students to one that intentionally supports every student in developing the dynamic range of skills we want to see in every graduate of our public K-12 system. They believe we must mount a systemic effort that includes the larger community of students, educators, families, and the public in understanding and supporting our students' growth and development first as human beings and then as learners. We can do that through Washington's profile of a graduate they have developed. This first slide on the profile shows only the larger categories of skills and attributes and how these characteristics align with our current laws around the goals for basic education and the purpose of a high school diploma. These laws already guide what students should know and be able to do by the time they graduate from high school. And so the work group hopes that the profile of a graduate will really bring these laws to life and help communities understand all of the ways that our education system helps develop our students as whole people beyond just their academic content knowledge. Next slide. This slide shows the larger categories of skills, as well as how the work group has grouped the subcategories of skills under each larger umbrella category. The development of these profile of our graduate skills is a lifelong process. So the K-12 system focus is to support students in developing age appropriate foundational skills, which prepare them for their next steps in life. Once fully implemented, we would expect all Washington students to be developing these skills throughout their K-12 education and that high school graduates would have the ability to draw upon each of these interconnected skills at the appropriate time. Next slide. I wanted to share the work group's major recommendations with you from their 2021 report. This first set of recommendations are around the profile of a graduate implementation. The work group understands that it's going to take districts some time to align their work to the vision that's laid out in the profile of a graduate. However, the state profile is our vision for the K-12 system moving forward to better support and develop every student as a whole person and prepare them to thrive in their life after high school. So districts are strongly encouraged to begin a process to align their priorities to the profile of a graduate vision and goals. We do not believe that implementation of the profile should be just one more thing that school districts are taking on in the midst of continuing to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. Rather, the profile of a graduate should serve as the North Star for a school district to help them design educational experiences that support every student in attaining the skills they will need in their journey after high school for success in post-secondary education, careers, citizenship, and lifelong learning. Each school district will be able to locally determine how to adapt their instruction to focus on developing these skills, as well as assess how students demonstrate they've gained foundational competency in each skill. One of the things that the work group recommended is that a group of educators, community members, and business representatives be convened to develop some sample rubrics and other tools for implementation that districts could use as a model to then adapt to their local context as they see fit. These should provide real life examples for how schools can actualize the profile of a graduate in kindergarten and first grade and so forth across our K-12 system. We believe providing these sample tools will be crucial to making the profile of a graduate actionable for all schools and to our effort to use the profile to reimagine our education system. At the student level, the high school and beyond plan will be invaluable as a tool for helping each student track their growth in the profile of a graduate characteristics and focus on what skills they need to develop for their personal goals for after high school. In order for the high school and beyond plan to fully support student learning and the profile of a graduate, the work group recommended additional work happen at the state level to make the high school and beyond plan more uniform and equitable for students across our state. The work group also recommended that the State Board of Education formally adopt the profile of a graduate and review the profile every 10 years through the state 
through a stakeholder engagement process to ensure that the skills outlined in the profile remain the top needs of the state according to K-12 stakeholders. The profile stays current over time. Shifting to the recommendations in the report around mastery-based learning, the workgroup's 2021 report builds on their 2020 report that explains that successful mastery-based learning implementation will require a variety of policy changes and other supports. For instance, the need for extensive professional learning for educators to make the shift to mastery-based learning successfully. As I mentioned, the legislature was generous in providing some funding to the state board to provide grants to schools around implementation for mastery-based learning. And so while the state board is seeking private funding to extend this effort, the state board will likely have continued request for ongoing funding from the legislature as we are able to demonstrate efficacy of the program. The work group is also recommending that a standardized state format for a mastery high school transcript be developed. We want to balance the concerns regarding capacity of our higher education partners to evaluate mastery transcripts with the desire of mastery based learning schools to move towards more equitable grading practices. So the work group recommended a phase in period for the adoption of the new mastery transcript for the schools who choose to use it determined by the state board in consultation with higher education partners and other stakeholders. The work group also provided some recommendations for the state board to consider in their work over the next year to develop recommendations to align graduation requirements to the profile of a graduate, including that students need to have graduation pathways that allow them to demonstrate in authentic ways what they are learning. Results of the state board's recent research on graduation pathway options show that students, families, and educators agree there's a need to include additional graduation pathway options that provide students with more opportunities for mastery-based learning. And students in particular expressed high interest for adding a mastery-based learning pathway. The work group also recommended that the state board consider the need for creating large categories of interdisciplinary learning standards to better support mastery based learning implementation because mastery based learning is inherently interdisciplinary. And finally, the work group recommended that the board consider developing a crosswalk between the state learning standards, the credit graduation requirements and the competencies based on the profile to help explain what skills we expect students to gain from each of the state subject area graduation requirements. Next slide. So we wanted to give just a little bit of a preview of the board's work to develop these recommendations to align graduation requirements to the profile of a graduate this year. If we could go to the next slide. As a reminder, although I'm sure you all know, our state graduation requirements include three major components, a student's high school and beyond plan, the credit and subject area requirements, and the graduation pathway options. Next slide. Paul, I'll hand it back over to you for this slide. One more slide. Yeah, next slide, please. No back one. <laughs> Leave it there. I think I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I can start. Okay, thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you, Senator Wellman. Um, thank you, Alyssa. A, a vital element of our work around mastery-based learning is aligning this approach with our graduation requirements. Legislature has charged the State Board of Education with a holistic examination of our graduation requirements and submitting recommendations on aligning graduation requirements with the profile of a graduate. The State Board of Education has taken up this charge and plans to have those recommendations to the state legislature by December of this year. In developing these recommendations, the state board is required to first consider the relationship between credits and core subject area requirements. Second, potential changes to those requirements. And finally, how the various components of the diploma can work together better as a system. Let me wrap up by saying that the profile of a graduate will play a central role 
in developing our recommendations because they unify our current mode of instruction with mastery-based learning instruction. We consider the profile of a graduate to be our roadmap to our educational destination because it is something that we need as a state. The profile of a graduate has helped us to define those things that are at the core of what we want for each and every one of our graduates in the state of Washington. The other important aspect of the profile is defining a standard set of outcomes we want for our students, regardless of whether they get traditional instruction or mastery-based learning instruction. So we look forward to engaging in this work over the next year, and we'll look to members of this committee to help inform that work. So thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate your offer, the opportunity to speak with you. Let's see if there are any questions from any of our committee members, and Senator Wilson has her hand up. Can we have a view of the uh, entire committee, please? Thanks, uh, Chair Wellman. I just, uh, I just had a question for Alyssa. Um, on your slides that uh, showed some examples of the portrait of a graduate, you gave one example from our state and the rest were from other states. And I'm just curious if you know or if we have data on how many individual districts within our state currently are operating or have um, the profile of a graduate or the pathways, uh, kind of the example that you gave. So just to clarify, Senator Wilson, you mean how many um, local school districts had their own profile of a graduate before Washington developed the state profile? Is that what you're Correct. asking? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry uh, if I wasn't clear. Thanks. No, no that's okay. Um, yeah. So I don't have uh, as detailed of data as I would like. Um, as you might imagine, several school districts reached out to me when they heard about the work to create the state profile. Um, and so what I'm aware of is only three that have their own local profile. There could be more, but those are the ones that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, um, other questions? Many committee members. So one of the things I think that is somewhat confusing, I will first of all say, um, I, I don't know if you're aware yet, uh, Alyssa and, and uh, Dr. Paul, but um, we have a bill that Senator Mullet has brought forth on financial literacy, which it just so happens, I think, aligns very well with those uh, with the portrait that, that has been developed by the Mastery Based um, Committee. And, um, and uh, Senator Mullet, were you, I don't know that you were thinking of portrait of a graduate, but I, I think that you must have been thinking about what should students have in order to be successful moving forward in, into uh, adulthood and to into their own self-sufficiency. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I agree. I think that was definitely the main purpose of the bill is just looking for things that we think are going to benefit them for the rest of their life that they may not be getting currently through our K-12 system at the moment. Yeah, and I think that what we what we do want to have is is everyone thinking about are we providing those things? Um, is there something that we need to do in our education system? Um, so thank you for bringing that bill. I'm excited about it, and I know how much um, chill, young people are asking for it as our education system. One of the things I think is somewhat confusing, and maybe you can touch upon it, either one of you, and that has to do with we have OSPI creating the standards for a course. So in, in a geometry, what are the specific things that would go into a course of geometry? Am I correct in that that comes from the, um, the, the office, the OSPI, but what you would be doing or what, what the, um, the state board would be doing would be determine how many credits of mathematics would be required for graduation for this pathway or that pathway. I, I, I think that there's confusion there. Anything you can say that would be helpful would be good. Sure, I can give it a shot and um, Dr. Petrie may join in as well. Um, but yes, Senator Wellman, uh, OSPI um, has the authority over creating the state learning standards. Um, and then the State Board of Education has authority over graduation or requirements, unless of course the legislature passes specific bills regarding graduation requirements. So what you said is exactly right. Um, the board will be looking at our graduation requirements and part of those are of course our credit and subject area requirements. 
So we'll be thinking about in light of the profile, um, do our credit requirements, for instance, having three years of math and four years of English language arts really align with the skills laid out in the profile of a graduate as the legislature charged us to do in the last legislative session. And, and I would also say, it seems to me that one thing we've thrown at you, which is an added thing um, in, in the mix is not only the learning standards and the credits, uh, but then how they align to any particular pathway and trying to figure out, you know, how that works, I think is a challenge, frankly. And uh, so I'm glad somebody is looking at it. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. That's part of why we feel like this question around how to create flexibility within the credit requirement framework um, is so important for the board to be considering and developing recommendations around in a holistic way, right? Considering um, how do our credit requirements really align with our graduation pathways? Because while we have these three different components of the diploma, um, they're sort of siloed. Um, and so we want to think about how can they work together better as a system to really support students preparing for their next steps for life after high school. I'll throw one other wrench in there. And that is, I think that just feels as though, and you know the systems better than I do, I'm sure, but it feels as though when we look at the education system that we have, we didn't necessarily do great preparation for apprenticeships. And we are now seeing that there's much more of an interest. I know Senator Kaiser is really doubling down and looking at apprenticeships as a way of establishing pathways uh, into various uh, professions and, and businesses. And so um, do you feel that there's space there or, or are we gonna need to be doing anything in order to support more apprenticeships or apprenticeships at all? Anybody? Anybody? I don't know, or just that we need to we need to do it. Uh, uh, I I think uh, Senator Wilson has her hand up. I, mean, I, I would like everybody yeah. to feel that they want to join in this discussion because I think that this is important. Yeah. Well, I, um, it's it's fascinating because a number of years ago the state legislature moved our vocational programming that was under K twelve to the higher ed system, and at the time. Uh, that was in the in 1990. At the time, we did have apprenticeships, we had vocational education, we had the things that we're talking about today in high school. And when those funds were moved to higher ed, a lot of those programs left and um, were not funded because they were funded through adult ed sources. And I think Carl Perkins' money, if I'm not mistaken, um, being a vocational educator from long ago. And so I think what we're doing now is seeing the fact that there's two things. One is the nuance is uh, we want all students across that stage with the ability to choose whatever pathway they want, be it uh, apprenticeships, be it certificated programs, licensure, be it a four year, two year, um, as opposed to putting a student in a pathway prior to crossing that path, that graduation um, stage and we did that early on where we saw a young person and based on who they were or how they might be acting um, decided early too early whether they would be successful or not so um, but we have to fund those programs and put them back in because uh, we as a state kind of took them away and Dr. Petrie I think you're nodding your head and so is Alyssa so I think I'm I'm telling the truth Okay, I, I'm not seeing anybody else having anything there. I'm going to throw one other thing in, and that is, um, and we don't have a PESB here, but I think that we really do need to be thinking about the teacher prep programs. Um, are we preparing our future teachers for mastery-based support education? Um, and and I, I will say, oddly enough, as I got my teaching certificate, uh, that was the focus. This is, of course, many years ago, but it, that was the focus. I was encouraged to be thinking of the different modalities of learning and making sure that the, that the students who were experiential, who had to do things with their hands and get involved with the subject matter in different ways, that was important for me to understand as an educator. But then when I got to the education system to actually teach, that wasn't what I found. And I, I think maybe, I don't know, whether that's being taught now, but we have to look into that. 
Are there any other things that you, having worked on this, Dr. Uh, Petrie, are there any other things that you think we should be looking at as ed, as legislators? Yeah, I think I think you're hitting on a really good point there. You know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that you know, in talking to my colleagues, you know, they refer to mastery-based learning, competency-based education, just as te good teaching. You know, this kind of er experiential learning, this engaged learning, and you know, these are the types of things that draw students to school. That that when they get up in the morning, it, it makes them excited. Um, but I also believe that while teachers do learn this in teacher education programs, it's probably not the biggest part of what they're what they're learning in, in that kind of traditional model of you know students in the row, the faculty member at the front of the, the classroom. That's more the dominant um, uh, mode of, of teaching or, or teacher education. And so I think you know, we really have an opportunity to begin to expand on that type of teacher education uh, to, to bring in this kind of engaged learning, this, this type of learning that um, also applies to, we were talking about apprenticeships and those types of things, those things that um, really draw students in and, um, and engage them and, and keep them excited about the educational process. You know, and, you know, exactly. just in terms of our economy, I mean, these, you know, these are the types of, of skills and, and, um, and, and background that our employers want students to bring to, to the workforce. So that's important as well. And we, and we certainly know that, um, you know, as we look forward uh, to not only lifespans, but to careers um, that, that you do and will need to be a lifelong learner, you will be recertifying, you know, uh, preparing over and over again, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's in medicine or law, which traditionally have constant education, but in any of the trades, the, the tools change, they've changed dramatically. The methodologies change when we look at what robotics is moving into and how that will affect different parts of, of the workforce. Um, there'll be different new jobs we talk about haven't been invented yet. And so we really need to make sure that we're being flexible enough to allow for that. Are there any questions from anybody else in the committee? If not, I will thank our presenters, Alyssa and Paul. Thank you so much for coming and giving us the update um, on what we set you out to do, which is to develop the portrait of a graduate. And um, we will look forward to hearing your recommendations, I guess, uh, uh, not quite a year from now. And um, then that will help inform our next session beyond this one. Thank you so much for being here. And if there are no further questions or comments, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you so much.